What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schoenberg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schoenberg Center to me is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life oh. happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior about Scholars about Program is going to do nothing but uplift <laughs> So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Bailey, and Harry Belafonte have graced the stage in this world of the American Negro. This place evokes the stage in this It was a gift to us and our community we really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw the young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amir Balaka went over to ask Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the moon. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our stories. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way to Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell the story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must the Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community. Inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. We invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center. 
My name is Novella Ford. I'm an associate professor of the program and sufficient mission at the Schomburg Center for Digital Transformation. We appreciate you joining us for Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. It has been an incredible nine months of learning from these virtual roundtable discussions with scholars the first Thursday of each month. As you saw in the video, the Schomburg Center is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of global Black experiences from the past to the present. And we continue that as we begin to close out our fall and winter and spring programming season. I ask you to save the date of June 18th and hope that you will join us for our fourth annual Schomburg Center Literary Festival, where we will be celebrating the rebellious spirit, celebrating the joyful courage, as well as the joyful necessity that we all get to encounter uh, you'll see behind me you'll see behind me it's not a beautiful it's not a beautiful it is the lit festival, festival, coming, festival together. coming together so, so i hope that you hope join us we'll drop a link in the chat excuse me <clears throat> to tell you more about the festival i also hope that you will visit the schomburg's website at schomburg.org to plan your visit and explore our exhibitions or research divisions explore public programs and more so like clockwork, tonight's conversation about the history of racism and resistance in the United States after the civil rights movement is right on time for the times that we are living through. You will hear more about tonight's program from this evening's curators, Dr. Robin Spencer, Associate Professor of History at Lehman College and co-curator of the series, Dr. Jane B. O'Harris. Please note books by our participants are available in person and online via the Shopper and online via and online and online at Shopper Shop. You can rewatch tonight, watch tonight, or any, any other this conversation on live stream page at livestream.com slash Schomburg Center and on our YouTube channel. To introduce you to tonight's program and participants, please welcome our co curators for this evening's conversation. Good evening. Um, we're really sorry about the Good technical evening. issues. Um, oh, it's still about the technical issues. Oh, it's still glitching. Um, it's really great to be here. Hopefully we will resolve these in a second. I'm Jean Theo Harris, a distinguished professor of political science at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. This is our 10th season of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. Kamozi Woodard, professor at Sarah Lawrence and I started Conversations in Black Freedom Studies in collaboration with the Schomburg Center a decade ago to create a space where the public could engage with new works in black history. With fewer and fewer public spaces to engage with bookstores closing, Conversations in Black Studies was conceived as a way to hear, learn, and discuss new work in black freedom studies. In many ways to, to bring us the history that we need to see the present more clearly. Kamozi, took on a more emeritus role last year, and I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome Robin C. Spencer, Associate Professor of History at Lehman College to be a co-curator. We are so pleased that the Schomburg Center has continued the series as one of its educational and public programming. We are also grateful for Eric Wallenberg, who has been the outreach coordinator and social media guru of the series for the past seven years. Our last program of the season will be Thursday, June 2nd, and it's gonna be a special one because we're gonna be featuring two new films on black struggle right here in New York and have their directors in conversation. Tayo Giwa and Cynthia Gordy Giwa will discuss their new film, The Sun Rises in the East, about the East, a Pan-African cultural organization whose impact on the culture of Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn is still being felt. And Emma Francis Snyder, will discuss her new short film on the health activism of the young lords in the South Bronx and the takeover of Lincoln Hospital with her documentary, Takeover, How We Occupied a Hospital and Changed Public Health. But tonight, we are so very excited for this evening's conversation 
focusing on racism and black resistance in the United States since the civil rights movement. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin C. Spencer, Associate Professor of History at Lehman College. I'm so happy you can hear me clearly because uh, this is a program that we all need to hear. Right, we're so delighted to be together online for this urgently, urgent and timely conversation on race and resistance since the civil rights movement. That's been the goal of conversations from the very beginning, the history we need to see the way forward. This is live streaming to YouTube and we'll put the link in the chat so you can share it with people who might be interested in joining us. The books our authors are talking about today are available at the Schomburg shop. And we'll be putting that link in the chat as well. So you can purchase them if you don't already have them. Um, you can follow us at, at Schomburg CBFS online. We're so delighted and honored to welcome tonight's panelists. Elizabeth Hinton is Associate Professor of History in the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies at Yale with a secondary appointment as professor of law at the law school. She's author of America on Fire, the untold history of police violence and black rebellion since the 1960s. Emily Hobson is chair of race, gender and identity and associate professor of race, gender and identity and history at the University of Nevada at Reno. She's co-editor of Remaking Radicalism a grassroots documentary reader of the United States, 1973 to 2001. Carol Anderson is a Charles Howard Candler Professor of African-American Studies at Emory University and author of the second, Race and Guns in a Faithfully Unequal America. Daniel Lux is an independent scholar and author of Reconsidering Reagan, Racism, Republicans and the road to Trump. Welcome. So where we wanted to start first was for each of you briefly to tell us how you came to this particular topic, what concerns or commitments or experiences or questions guided your journey to this particular work. And Elizabeth, let's start with you. Great. First, um, thank you so much, Professor Theo Harris and Spencer for inviting me and to my panelists for engaging. I am just so honored to be here. Um, so in many ways, America on Fire came out of questions in my first book, which is a history of federal crime control policies uh, from the Johnson administration through the Reagan administration. And one of the things I argued in that book is that um, the threat of rebellion or so-called riots was really central in getting Johnson to call um, the war on crime in 1965. And I knew in doing the research for that book that uh, the, the typical timeline that we think of for these forms of political violence um, went into the 1970s. You know, we think of it starting in Harlem in 1964 and lasting through um, really the hundred or so rebellions after Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968. But I knew that, that they were continuing and that this actually was really a story of how black communities were responding to the expansion and militarization of police um, in their communities post-civil rights. And I just happened to be at a barbecue and I was introduced to this political scientist named Christian Davenport who heads the Radical Information Project at Michigan. We started talking about rebellions and he was like, I have an archive for you, which was the news clippings of the Lemberg Center for the Study of Violence local news sources, which documented um, and, and told a completely new chapter of US history, which is that, you know, from 1964 to 1968, there are about 3000 or so rebellions, or sorry, 300 or so rebellions. After Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination through 1972, there are nearly 2000. We had actually missed the peak of when this form of violence happens, which really changes how we understand the way communities are responding to the war on crime, how, black protests, post King, um, and the kind of changing terrain that of, of, um, of many black communities in the post-civil rights period. So in many ways, this was happenstance. I happened to get access to the right archive um, and the rest is history. Um, thank you also so much for having me, Professor Thea Harris and Spencer and everyone at the Schomburg. I, I love the Schomburg so much. It's wonderful to be here in this space. Um, so remaking radicalism is a little different 
um, than some of the other books in that it's an anthology rather than a monograph or you know, a kind of single story. So it's an anthology of original sources from all different kinds of social justice movements in the United States from 1973 to 2001. And I, I co-edited the, co the book with my colleague, Dan Berger. And our goal in putting the book together was really to create a resource that could be used in a variety of ways we hope to understand and build on the recent radical past. We hope that it'll be used in classrooms and in political political education circles and activist groups and you know hopefully also in in forums you know like this one where people are just interested in public dialogue about the meanings of social movement histories really from the process of putting the book together i think dan and i just learned a lot about organizations and campaigns that we had some sort of glancing sense of from our own more focused research but that we began to understand in in better detail and we really strengthened our understanding of the ways that radicalism has persisted, right? It didn't go away. Um, you know, certain kinds of uh, issues and campaigns went into abeyance, but then came back later and new kinds of formulations came up, right, across the period. And in, in fact, also many different kinds of organizing became re-energized, right, at varying points since the 60s. So, you know, in, in addressing the period from 1973 through 2001, I think we go beyond some of the typical narratives of radical movements that kind of end with the end of the long 60s and end with the Black Power era, and that often also blame Black Power for a kind of perceived decline in mobilization. And I think we, we really counter that by showing the breadth and the range and the vitality of different kinds of movements across the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And, you know, we really treat the long black freedom struggle as extending across that time in ways that I think haven't yet been discussed as fully as they might, and that also continue to hold influences in other kinds of movements traditionally seen as separate, right, including feminist and queer movements, environmental um, activism, and all kinds of different causes. And I also want to just say thank you so much for this wonderful invitation and for putting together this panel. Wow, just thank you. How I came to the second was through the killing of Philando Castile, because here you had a black man who was doing everything he was supposed to do. Um, and part of that was alerting the officer who had pulled him over that he had a license to carry weapon with him following NRA guidelines. And the police officer then pulled out his gun and put five bullets into Philando Castile. And so you have a black man who is killed, not for brandishing a weapon, not for threatening to, to shoot the police officer, but for merely having a license to carry legal gun. And the NRA went silent, virtually silent. And this is the NRA of calling the federal government, you know, jackbooted thugs, government thugs went at Ruby Ridge and at Waco. So to get that kind of visceral response from the NRA, when you have white folks killing federal officers, but to go virtually silent when a black man is killed. And so you had pundits asking, well, don't African-Americans have second amendment rights? And I am a human rights scholar. And I thought, wow, that is a great question. And that is a right that I have not explored yet. Let me go hunting. And oh my gosh, what I found, I went back into the 17th century and started digging. And what I found was the power of anti-blackness, the power of the fear of black people in shaping the second amendment, in shaping the response to this right. And so sitting in the middle of our bill of rights is the right to control and contain black people. Thank you uh, for having me. And it's an honor to be here with such a distinguished group of scholars. How and why I came to my topic. Um, I was an undergrad at Berkeley and a law student during the Reagan revolution. And throughout this period, I was really mystified and confounded by his transcendent political popularity. Uh, like most good Berkeley students, I vehemently opposed his policies. I protested. Uh, the, the imminent, his bellicose rhetoric in South Africa, in Central America, and uh, protested 
his support of the racist apartheid regime. Um, and years later, I was aghast at the conservative movement's success in canonizing him as a great American and distorting his record beyond recognition. Um, after law school, I worked as a criminal defense attorney and I represented many, many uh, poor people of color who faced hard jail times for petty drug crimes. And I had a front row seat to Reagan's racist war on drugs. Uh, later in my late 30s, early 40s, I went back to grad school and I wrote a book about the impact of the Vietnam War on the civil rights movement. And I devoured the civil rights literature and I realized that there was a big gap in the historiography on Reagan and the conservative movement's abysmal legacy on race and civil rights. So I thought that this would be a, a, a good project. Now, after Obama's 2008 victory, I was one of the naive people who believed that we had entered a post-racial society. I don't know why I believed that, but I did. I guess I was naive. And my hopes were quickly punctured by the, the racial furies of the Tea Party and this desire and hatred of Obama and wanting to turn America back to the pre-civil rights era. Um, so I started thinking about the project when the so-called party of Reagan refused to distance itself from the birther conspiracy movement. And, and I was halfway done with a rough draft when Trump, when Trump shocked the world by, by winning. And... The seamlessness in which the party of Reagan morphed into the party of Trump seemed to validate my view that Reagan planted the seeds for Trumpism and fortified my desire to finish the book. And then, the, and then it came out in the summer of 2020, a few weeks after the shocking murder of George Floyd roiled the country. So that, that's basically how I, I came to my, my project. Thank you. So now is the part of the program where you all get to teach us something. Um, give us a window into your work and how it expands or changes the way we see the history of the past 50 years. What does it mean to focus on racism and resistance after the civil rights and black power movements? What intervention does your work make to show us this more recent past anew? Uh, and Emily, we'll start with you. Right, so it's such an important question and really one of the central arguments of remaking radicalism is that as radicals took on a growing range of issues and tactics after the early 1970s, that this range was not a problem as has sometimes been, been stated, but really a strength. Um, so that activists were increasingly drawing power from making links across different kinds of issues and communities and tactics. Um, and so we also argue then that to fully understand confrontations with racism and forms of resistance after civil rights and black power, that we have to really look at that interplay between movements, campaigns, organizations, and so on. And to even also be able to narrate individual activist life stories, for example, how one individual person might have moved from, let's say, the anti-apartheid movement to AIDS activism and then back to the global justice movement as, as one possible example. And that despite that kind of range and mobility for individual activists, there were also new kinds of coherence. One of the most important forms of coherence that we really identify in the book is the growth and the elaboration of intersectional feminism as really central to this period and as coming especially, um, although not exclusively out of black women's organizing, um, especially by the late 60s. And equally, in combination with that, we really put our focus on grassroots visions for change rooted in autonomous community organizing, not necessarily tied to electoral politics or to particular kinds of sectarian party formations. Um, so there's two documents in the books that I'd point to to illustrate these ideas and that I think also help us think about the present. The first is the Crips and Bloods plan for the reconstruction of Los Angeles, which is called Give Us the Hammer and the Nails, We Will Rebuild the City. It was written soon after the Los Angeles uprising of 1992, which of course saw its 30th anniversary last week. And the Crips and the Bloods, um, you know, as gangs were especially important in the 80s, and they really formed in the vacuum of the urban crisis, right, or of state abandonment of communities of color, um, as well as in the vacuum of the state repression and the internal collapse of the Black Panther Party. 
And so what we see in the Crips and Bloods document is that the gangs really, you know, also themselves showed the potential to work in leadership and to express a political vision. They signed a truce after the uprising and their plan for the reconstruction of LA centered on urban redevelopment led by and for community members rather than corporate interests, um, massive reinvestment in public education and youth programs, and also a real attention to the interplay between healthcare and real deficits in healthcare in the city and welfare benefits and access to parks and rec. And then the second document that I'd point to is a really important example of intersectional feminist work in general, and especially how that has been central to the framework of reproductive justice. So it's a short essay on Sister Song by Loretta Ross, one of the key founders of Sister Song, which is a national multiracial coalition of women of color organizations working for reproductive justice, including not just the right to not have a child, including of course access to abortion, but also the right to have a child, opposing coerced sterilization and population control, and the right to raise children in safe and healthy environments not in poverty, not in exposure to toxics or feeling, fearing police brutality around the corner. So it's a framework that struggles at the intersections, not only of identities, but also of forms of state violence. And that's, I think, really especially important in this current week. And for me, it, in looking at this period of the Second Amendment, it is seeing the ways that the legal status of African-Americans does not alter the anti-Blackness core of the Second Amendment. So that you get the Black Panthers who realize that the police are just pounding on the Black community. And, 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 and the Panthers are determined to provide self-defense for that Black community. And they know the law. And so they come armed, they know how far away to stand from the police and the police do not like it. Um, so you see the, the, the documents going back and forth going, you know, we pull them over and we try, to, we try to arrest them but everything they're doing is legal. How do we make them illegal? And so you see then the conservative, I mean, so this is part of what flips our narrative about the way we understand gun laws. And so you see cons the conservative, uh, assemblyman Don Mulford writing the law with the help of the NRA and Ronald Reagan eager, eager to sign this bill that will outlaw the way that the Black Panthers use guns in order to provide self-defense for the Black community. So you see this coalition of, of the right wing who we often think of as being so pro-Second Amendment and so anti-gun control until those guns are in the hands of black people. And, and so part of what I also see is I'm, I'm carrying through to this period where we see the rise of the NRA and the rise of the second amendment as being this hallowed cherished ground of full blown citizenship. It is the way that citizenship is defined and it becomes defined in these key areas of stand your ground, of, of the right to bear arms and of open carry. And what we see then is that when African Americans use those rights, they have basically put crosshairs on them because anti-Blackness is so strong that it's already seen as a threat. When you put guns in the hands of that anti-Blackness, it becomes an exponential threat. So when we think of stand your ground and we think of how George Zimmerman is able to gun down a child, an unarmed child, and walk. How Marissa Alexander, however, is protecting herself from domestic violence by firing a, a warning shot, and she's given 20 years. We see when it comes to open carry, how Kyle Rittenhouse can carry an, an illegally obtained AR-15 and, and the police welcome him, embrace him. But in Ohio, when Tamir Rice, who's a 12 year old child, is playing in the park with a toy gun, that the police roll up and within two seconds, they gun him down. And they're talking about, we were threatened, he is dangerous. And we see the, the whole, the castle doctrine. What we see in the castle doctrine, this is what killed Breonna Taylor because you, when somebody invades your home, you have the right to protect your home. 
when the police burst into her apartment, her boyfriend fired a weapon to protect themselves. And instead she's gunned down and it's seen as justifiable. The same here in Atlanta, where a 92 year old black woman in early in the morning, she hears the burglar bars being removed from her house. She gets her rusty revolver to defend her castle, to defend herself. And when the police burst in with a no knock warrant, she shoots and they put a fusillade of bullets in her, justifiable. The thing that made hers not justifiable is that the cops had forged the documents to get the warrant. And then they had put pressure on one of their informants to back them up. And instead, he, knowing that he could not trust the police, he went to the news station. And that's what blew that story wide open. But when you begin to think about how we define citizenship, and the civil rights movement was supposed to have handled citizenship. But when we're looking at stand your ground, when we're looking at the castle doctrine, when we're looking at open carry, what we see is an unequal, the inequality of the second amendment because it is designed to contain and control black people. And that's part of what we, I want us to begin to understand what I'm adding to the historiography in this period. What I'm adding to the historiography in my book on, on Reagan and look, examining the last 50 years of the conservative movement is the continuity. Um, I argue that Trump is the culmination of where the GOP and the conservative movement have been trending since Goldwater and Reagan took over the party in 1964 as states rights conservatives. And in my view, uh, Reagan is kind of the key for all subsequent developments. Um, as evidence, you know, look at what happened the other day with the release of political's blockbuster draft of Alito's opinion overturning Roe v. Wade. And um, this is also the culmination of a 50 year campaign by grassroots conservatives and their white nationalist Christian allies to return America to the 50s. And all you did is look at the players. For example, Alito, uh, was a young attorney in, in Reagan's Justice Department. Clarence Thomas was head of the Reagan's EO, EEOC. And as I talk about in my book, Chief Justice Roberts, who's now considered somewhat of a moderate, uh, was a young lawyer in Reagan's DOJ, and he was clamoring to vitiate the Voting Rights Act of 1981. Um, Alito's Opinion is also rooted in originalism, which is another Reagan era, which was a Reagan era doctrine that was popularized by Ed Meese. And uh, until the 80s, originalism was really a fringe doctrine. Um, so on racial matters, I argue that the conservative movement had a long standing campaign to, uh, desire to reverse the gains of the civil rights movement. And this kind of undermines the view that Trump suddenly hijacked the decent and noble legacy of Reagan. This is something that never Trumpers are always talking about, that Reagan was a good man and Trump was an aberration. Um, and, you know, I, I confess that Reagan had good manners and he would have been appalled by Trump's racist barks and as well as Trump's propitiation to Putin. But... I argue that Reagan, um, that Trump and his white Christian nationalists are not sui generis, but have been percolating in the conservative movement since 1964, when Barry Goldwater embraced states' rights conservatism. In addition to Reagan, it's also important to note that, the, that I talk about how the modern conservative movement was infested with racism from its inception. Um, from the moment that Buckley in 1955 formed the National Review to melt and welded the conservative movement into a whole, uh, the conservative movement sided with the segregationists, opposed the black freedom struggle, and Buckley famously vowed to stand athwart history. And one of the things that he wanted to stand athwart was the black freedom struggle. Uh, Buckley, who happened to be Reagan's mentor, opposed, uh, vilified Brown versus Board of Education as, as an act of judicial usurpation, 
uh, talked about how since the South was currently the superior civilization, it had to prevail. And eventually, as all of us know, the, the, the former states of the Confederacy became the heart of the conservative movement. Uh, Reagan, I mean, I'm just kind of synthesizing some of my main arguments, but people always think of Reagan as like a hardcore, that Reagan was all about anti-communism and limiting the scope of government. But when he ran for governor in 1966 in California against Pat Brown, race was kind of central to his campaign. Um, he opposed the landmark civil rights legislation, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He called the urban areas jungles in, in the wake of the 1965 Watts uprising that, that had a lot of resonance. He opposed fair housing. And Reagan basically mastered the art of uh, appealing to the fears of whites without sounding racist. Um, in his pre-presidential years, uh, Reagan's political base was in the booming Sun Belt and in the South. He ran for president in 68 and in 76 and did very well in the South. I could provide, he became uh, the, the main apostle of law and order. I could provide a lot of examples, but perhaps most telling, and I don't know if a lot of the audience knows this, that hours after King's assassination, Reagan called it a great tragedy that began when we started compromising with law and order and people started choosing which laws they wanted to break. So Reagan was in effect kind of blaming King and the whole project of nonviolent civil disobedience for his own assassination. Um, you know, we are, we are currently seeing the fruits of the conservative movement's decades long campaign to roll back the civil rights revolution. And the attacks on voting rights obviously represent an imminent threat to democracy. And this all began in, in, in the early 80s. And I mentioned John Roberts's role in trying to vitiate the Voting Rights Act. It didn't happen thanks to, um, you know, the grassroots organizations of, of, of the civil rights uh, organizations. Um, and, it, and instead of trying to expand civil rights, Reagan made dismantling affirmative action the focus of the civil rights agenda and argued that white males were now the true victims of discrimination. And, you know, these attacks on affirmative action are kind of reminiscent of the current kind of fake brouhaha over critical race theory, which, you know, makes white people and victims of, of our historical scourge of slavery and racism. Um, so, you know, all of these kind of attacks on voting rights, uh, also Reagan tried, Reagan, uh, you know, packed the courts with originalists bent on reversing the landmark jurisprudence of the Warren Court. Uh, fortunately, Reagan's a lot of Reagan's acts failed. Uh, we were the, able to fight back and against the Bork nomination. We were, you know, the civil rights lobby, with the help of its political ally, was was able to ensure affirmative action. But you know, all of this stuff uh, that's going on was it kind of has a lot of roots in the Reagan years, and most grievously. It's important to note that, you know, remember that Reagan ratcheted up the racist war on drugs, which has devastated communities of color and led to our current crisis of mass incarceration. So by any conceivable standard, the Re Reagan was an unmitigated disaster for African-Americans. So, I mean, in some ways, you know, my, my book is dealing with with similar things. Certainly the the targeted criminalization of, um, of people of color in this country that begins ironically, right, at the height of um, the civil rights revolution and progressive social change. And um, my book is really trying, America on Fire is really trying to open up um, what, how we think about the freedom struggle and, and um, black protests and is urging us to take, um, rebellions to take black political violence in the 60s and early 70s and beyond seriously um, in order to avoid the kind of policy trap um, or the cycle of police violence and community violence that we've been stuck in 
ever since. Um, so here terminology, of course, is really important. As soon as um, Harlem erupts in 64 after a 15 year old high school student named James Powell is killed by the NYPD, uh, Lyndon Johnson and many others immediately say, you know, this is a riot. This is criminal. This is lawless and meaningless. It has nothing to do with civil rights. Um, which of course wasn't true. Um, in labeling this form of political violence, which was rooted, which you know, nearly all of the 2000 some incidents that I study um, you know, were, were set off by a police encounter, but they were rooted um, in the same grievances as the mainstream civil rights movement. That is an end to police brutality. I think we often forget how central um, you know, fights against police brutality were to civil rights struggles. Um, educational opportunities, decent housing, uh, full political and economic inclusion. That's what these rebellions were about. In labeling them criminal, then the only solution <laughs> becomes the police, which is, of course, uh, the very thing that people are rebelling against. And we have been stuck in this cycle where we have failed to see, we, we, we have failed to come to terms with where um, the gains of the civil rights movement stopped and the, the necessary and unfinished socioeconomic reforms that are um, very much needed. And this, the archive that I mentioned, I think really hammers this point home and brings it alive because it shows um, in the back of the book, I have a 25 page timeline of, of the rebellions kind of laying the data clear. And they're not just in you know Harlem and Watts and big cities. They are across the United, big cities in the Northeast, I should say. They are across the United States um, in small towns, mid-sized cities, rural communities in the Southern states. There were a lot of rebellions in the Southern states. Again, we have this kind of false dichotomy between North and South in forms of protest. Um, this, this history really like opens that up to say, um, that the, 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 the ultimate decision in many ways to respond to civil rights gains by criminalizing low-income communities of color and disinvesting um, in the long-term vital resources from those communities has again kept us in this cycle of police violence and black rebellion. Um, you know, we fail to see that this form of protest after King's assassination uh, was really the, the, the most widely adopted form of protest among young black people. And, um, and again, that, that changes how we understand the civil rights movement, the post-civil rights period, and how black communities immediately responded again to policing in their communities. I think another really big um, uh, lesson or takeaway from the book is that, um, you know, police violence precipitates community violence, not the other way around. That um, in in all of the in all of the rebellions, the police were the instigators. Um, residents experienced the way that they were being policed as violent in and of itself, because especially in the late 60s and early 70s, rebellions erupted in response to the policing of everyday ordinary activity. They happened when police showed up to um, a house party and started arresting people. You know, again, something that would never happen in a middle class or white community. They happen when police started, you know, messing with a group of teenagers hanging out on the corner after school. Um, and, and that, you know, the, the, the kind of disruption of everyday life um, as police are taking on, um, are, 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 you know, getting new investments on the part of the federal government, getting new military grade armored vehicles and bulletproof vests and AR-15 rifles, um, you know, the, the response to that, to those violent conditions was to, um, was to fight back. And so that again, keeps us in this cycle where the only, uh, the only response when we fail to see the socioeconomic root causes, then the only response is more police. And that's why, you know, from James Powell in 64 to Breonna Taylor in 2020, uh, we continue to see these violent encounters that, that should not happen, uh, between police and, um, and women and men of color. Thank you. Um, just one reminder to our audience, which is coming to us from all over the country and the world, is that if you, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, all of the books our presenters are talking about are on sale at the Schomburg shop, uh, both online and at the Schomburg itself, and we'll drop that link into the chat as well. So part of the point of conversations is the history we need to see the present more clearly. Um, there are a lot of myths about the civil rights movement and the United States since the civil rights movement. And this is kind of a lightning round. Um, 
if each of you could give us one myth that your work challenges. Uh, and I'm gonna start with Carol. We have overcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think it gets more lightning than that, but we hear it over and over and over. You know, the signs came down. What more do you people want? We have overcome. We have crossed the racial Rubicon. No, we haven't. And I've got to say that builds on my first book, Eyes Off the Prize, the United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights, because what happened there was in the 40s, Black folks understood that they were in a human rights struggle because they had dealt with centuries of a human rights violation. And that it was going to take a human rights platform to deal with a human rights violation. And instead, because of the Cold War, because of labeling healthcare as socialism, um, because of labeling uh, labor as being communistic, is what it did was it pushed black folks off of that human rights platform and it moved it onto a civil rights platform to try to deal with this human rights violation on a civil rights platform. We have not overcome. I agree. And that's one of the myths that my book punctures that, that old notion that the arc of history is long but bends towards justice. I think, you know. Uh, that, that, that is a myth. Um, given the uh, salience of uh, our current moment of Roe v. Wade, I came, I uncovered a myth in my book, uh, in my studies, and I wasn't the first person to, to say this, but the whole moral majority or evangelical movement that kind of came to the fore in Reagan's first campaign in 1980 and since has become a staple of the conservative movement. There's this myth that it was all about abortion and traditional values and, you know, LGBT fears of, you know, gays, et cetera, et cetera. But really it was all about race. And a lot of people don't really know this, but um, it, initially it was really only the Catholic church that was, that was opposed to the abortion. The, 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 the ministers, the evangelicals in the South really weren't that interested. It wasn't until about five years later that they came on board because what really, really energized the evangelicals was when uh, Jimmy Carter's IRS started to revoke the tax exempt status for these private segregated academies that mushroom throughout the South to circumvent Roe v. Wade. And this, this really pissed them off to the point that they got involved in politics. It was all about race. Um, and I have a good quote from Paul Weirich, who some of you might know was a leading, you know, uh, foot soldier in the Christian movement. I, I think he was a Catholic, but he said what galvanized the Christian community was not abortion, school prayer, or the ERA. What changed their mind was Jimmy Carter's intervention against the Christian schools trying to deny them tax exempt status. So this, this highlights the, the, the potency of racism, which is the American poison. It, perme it permeates all phases of the conservative movement and is really what has impeded uh, a coalition between you know, poor, poor whites and why they often vote against their self-interest. I guess one of the biggest myths, you know, I already mentioned the police violence myth, um, but I think one of the, the, the biggest ones and maybe the most tragic is that, you know, the idea that we haven't known or we haven't had other options. And that's simply not true. Um, when we look at um, the Kerner Commission, right, among, among many others. But the Kerner Commission in 1968, which Johnson called in the middle of the Detroit Rebellion in 67, the Kerner Commission said, look, if we really want to address uh, the root causes of this violence in our cities, uh, then we have to go well beyond the war on poverty. We need, we need to mobilize the public and private sector for a major job creation program for low-income people. Uh, what ended up happening was a job creation program for police through the war on crime. Uh, the Kerner Commission also said we need a, the complete, we don't need this remedial education. We need an overhaul and we need new investments in public schools. We need a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, we need to transform housing. 
None of this happened. And we can imagine where the U.S. would be now. Um, I'm so thankful that Professor Hobson brought up the uh, Crips and Bloods proposal to rebuild L.A., which I write about in my chapter on the L.A. rebellion in 1992, because that's another um, really, really key missed opportunity where essentially these mostly young men, um, Crips, Sets and Watts, said, OK, you know what, we're going to we're going to stop the violence and we're going to stop participating in the underground economy here's a $4 billion plan, give us some jobs, invest in our schools, once again, um, you know, empower us to be a part of public safety in our communities, um, make our communities beautiful, and, 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 and that's that, LA will be rebuilt. And this proposal, of course, uh, was completely ignored. So we've had time and time, those are just two examples. We've known what's necessary. We don't need another task force to tell us how bad systemic racism is and where the investments need to be made. We know where they need to be made. We've been sitting on them um, now for well over a half a century. And the question is, you know, when and will we make them? And, you know, I think this is sort of a looking at some of that from the other side. I think another myth that we have is that activists don't really think very deeply and they all agree with each other. <laughs> right. Um, you know, there's there's a, a it's, it's really important to take seriously the thinking and the visions that go on in varying kinds of community organizing, right? And, you know, so the, the Crips and Bloods document is just one example of that, but there are so many that give us a lot of guidance. And some of that guidance comes from looking at points of debate and disagreement. Um, you know, so one critique that really emerged in a lot of organizing settings by the, nine, by the 1990s and that really has continued since has been about the growing non-profitization of a lot of progressive um, work, right? So the critique that nonprofits and foundations were starting to really set the agenda in ways that undermine mass mobilization. And I, I think this is a really important critique to look at, but in and of itself, it's another layer of a myth, right? To say that just everybody went to nonprofits or that nonprofits explain everything about how um, activists began to navigate state disinvestment and neoliberalism, right? So one of the things uh, that I think we really try to do in remaking radicalism is to look at a very wide range of different kinds of responses. So we have documents that come out of 501c3 organizations, right? That are doing work, but we also have anarchist and direct action work. We have a lot of international solidarity um, work that is totally kind of apart from organizations. We have worker centers that are kind of challenging the the labor movement um, and other kinds of strategies. And we look at the ways that those also began to be shared and developed across communities defined more by race or by sexuality or other kinds of groups. Um, and I think that, that looking at that kind of debate about the forms of ways to respond to uh, the ways in which you know, indeed we have not overcome, <laughs> right? Which is absolutely an important point is that really there continues to be today a really important debate within varying kinds of activist circles about how much to push to win from the state, from the government or through the state versus how much to really just turn away, right? From it through strategies like mutual aid or indigenous sovereignty work or certain aspects of prison abolition. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from those strategies about that, that look at um, both engaging with and struggling with and trying to reinvigorate the welfare state and also those who critique the welfare state is always also a warfare state and a carceral state, right? Um, and that we can, we can think about those while also holding the cautions that would say that, you know, just abandoning any demands on the state kind of just leave everything up to, you know, deeper and deeper austerity. So I think I, I would sort of challenge certainly the idea that activists don't really think, right? Um, but also the idea that there's some kind of monolithic um, set of visions, right? Then that really, I think we can learn from looking at some of the points of disagreement um, and that those are as much the what's valuable about interconnections among movements as the kind of points of obvious agreement and alignment. Thank you. I want to say that the chat is on fire. We're getting all sorts of amazing <laughs> comments from um, scholars, thinkers, uh, people who know, people who have been there, people who have 
written these important works, people who are bringing in our the very same activists that uh, Dr. Hobson just mentioned and their whole uh, impact and work. So read the chat, not only read the chat, go into the chat. If you are listening and you have a question, one more question to go to have our group discussion, and then we will dive right into wherever you as the audience uh, want us to go. I want to ask the panelists, um, can you introduce us to one character um, that you have encountered in your research that you think more people need to know about? Is there any individual um, we're trying to just add more information, more knowledge, more, more names, more people for other people to uh, research and learn more about? I know it's an impossible question because there's so many, but is there any one striking story that you can um, share with us um, so the audience uh, can have that person's story and history and impact as a takeaway? Well, that's a really difficult question because I cover so much ground in my book. Um, I indict, you know, all the major figures in the conservative movement, Buckley, Reagan, Barry Goldwater, uh, all the conservative intellectuals. Uh, there are, so there are many villains. Um, also, there are many heroes and there are many people who did a, who, who did a courageous job in, in combating Reagan's, the Reagan era's attempt to reverse the gains of the civil rights movement. Uh, the, the, uh, anti-apartheid movement, um, but if, you know, if there was any one person, I, you know, I would, there's this a gentleman named Ralph Neas, N-E-A-S, he's, he's not so well known, he's a white liberal, um, and he, I kind of found him to be a, somewhat of a ubiquitous figure in all these titanic battles in the 80s over voting rights, affirmative action, uh, the Bork, he kind of spearheaded the opposition to the Bork nomination. Um, he was head of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which was kind of the legislative arm on the civil rights movement. So he was, he was kind of uh, instrumental in opposing the Reagan's attempt to vitiate the Voting Rights Act in 1981. Um, and uh, he also played a major role in making Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. Um, yeah, he, Nice was an unsung hero. That's not to say that he was more important than all these other great people like Elizabeth Holmes Norton, Angela Davis. I mean, a whole list of people that fought back against Reagan. But he was just somebody that seemed to be ubiquitous. And he was always there. And he, he was very effective. And at first, a lot of the civil rights establishment was, were somewhat leery about having a white liberal being named to such an important position but at the end they all kind of when he retired they all kind of touted his uh, effectiveness and in 1995 ted, ted kennedy lauded nice as the 101st senator for civil rights so i don't think anybody's going to write a book about ralph nice but he just kind of struck me as somewhat of an unsung hero so for me, I have to choose a uh, a place and not a person. And um, that place is Cairo, Illinois, which um, is a small town at the southernmost tip um, of Illinois that um, plays a really important role through the first half of um, my book because that's the site of the longest, um, most protracted rebellion that lasted essentially from 69 uh, through 72. And part of the reason why um, the violence in, in Carroll was lasted for so long was because um, the the kind of white establishment in the city, so the, which was just under about 4,000 residents, just under a black majority um, who were completely locked out of, um, of any kind of uh, social, political or economic power, employ jobs in the city, um, decent housing, et cetera. Uh, the, the white establishment um, and the a, a vigilante terrorist white supremacist organization called the White Hats and the police department were all very much um, working in tandem. And um, Carroll had witnessed a series, just like all the other cities that rebelled, um, of nonviolent direct action protests through uh, the 1960s. And this had not, by the end of the decade, um, fundamentally changed conditions for Black residents in the city. Um, 
And eventually, uh, the the white the white supremacist organization began um, shooting nightly into the um, all black housing project, uh, which which where where most of the black residents in the city lived. Um, and eventually, the the residents um, began to arm themselves and fight back. And while um, engaging in this continued rebellion to protect themselves and their family against the kind of twin forces of um, of white political and economic elite violence and police violence. They also boycotted um, all of the stores in downtown Cairo, which were owned by white businessmen, because they were like, we're not going to patronize these stores to give these white supremacists money to buy bullets to then shoot at us um, and our family at night. And instead of so this is where, you know, Cairo is kind of a parable for how racism is bad for all of us and will kill all of us. Instead of, of giving the near black majority um, concessions, instead of saying, okay, you know what, we, we're gonna, we, you know, this is racist, this is horrible, we're gonna stop shooting at you, we're gonna open up job opportunities and decent housing for you. Instead of doing that, uh, the city said, you know what, no, we're just gonna let our businesses close. We're just gonna throw, fill the pool with concrete we're just going to let our property values go down, right? And and the, their, their their decision to hold on to white supremacy um, ended up, of course, being bad economically for them um, and their children and their grandchildren because their property values went down, right? And so now Cairo is considered a ghost a ghost town. Um, it's majority black. Um, it has a struggling economy, and this is simply because um, white supremacy and 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 the violence that comes with it uh, was upheld over just basic decency um, and 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 economic and social and political livelihood for everyone. And so, you know, for us, that is a signal that racism will kill us. Um, we'll kill everybody. It's bad for white people too uh, if we allow it to, and if it is not stopped. Yeah, so in some ways, this sort of idea of, you know, a, a person that you don't know about is sort of the goal of the whole book, right? Um, to provide a kind of set of teasers that you might want to learn more about. Um, Remaking Radicalism has 164 written documents, um, as well as uh, 20 images and some short essays, and as well as introductory material to kind of help help you think through all this, all this work. But one of the uh, individual story that I'll, I'll leave you all with is that of um, Ashanti Alston. He wrote an essay from 2001 called Beyond Nationalism, But Not Without It. Um, it comes towards the end of the book. And Ashanti Alston was a member of the Black Panther Party in New Jersey. He joined as a teenager. And after the case of the Panther 21, he joined the Black Liberation Army and then went underground with the BLA. Um, he was incarcerated for 14 years as a result of his work with the BLA. And he's, he's still alive today. We've lost many such veterans and elders, but um, he's alive today. And I, I was noticing in the chat, um, some folks really kind of calling on us to also recognize Black Panther women, which I absolutely would agree with. And I would note that Alston was married to an equally powerful organizer, Sophia Bukhari. Um, sadly, she passed away in 2003. And so I think about Alston in part because I really wanted to highlight someone still with us. Um, and one of the things I think is interesting about Alston is his, is his political trajectory. Over his time in prison and increasingly afterwards, Alston identified himself as he describes in this essay in the book as a, he called himself a postmodernist anarchist. Um, and he also said, I'm a 60s child. I found black nationalism as a lifesaver, but he also talks in this essay about be, coming to be very critical of the idea of monolithic categories of national belonging, right? As well as monolithic ideas of class struggle or black struggle or any kind of other category, right? That there's no one single worker, there's no one singular, single kind of member of a black nation and so on due to the problems of sexism, homophobia, racism that have, have really troubled many different kinds of radical traditions, right? Um, but he really emphasizes in this essay that he continues to embrace the legacies of black nationalism as a kind of politics in motion, right? Not in stasis. He says that it constantly rallies our people to come together, to remember our history, love ourselves, dream on and fight back. 
And so I think his, his trajectory in this essay is a really wonderful kind of way to think about the flexibility and the, the shifts of different kinds of political traditions after the 60s, as well as the ongoing centrality of, of black organizing um, into today. And I'm getting ready to break the rules. Um, so I'm getting ready to go back to the 19th century and talk about a man, William Parker, who uh, during the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, where basically the rule was that any slave owner could, could go to wherever their enslaved um, members had run and seize them with the help of the Northern governments. And so uh, a slave owner named Edward Gorsuch out of Maryland goes up to Christiana, Pennsylvania, and he's coming to get his property. And he knocks and he has a US Marshal with him, his son and a nephew. And he knocks on the door of a man named William Parker. And Parker himself was a fugitive slave. And he knocks on Parker's door and he's like, I've come to get my property. And Parker says, you see that chair? That's not yours. You see that table? That's not yours. I'm talking, talking smack. I love it. And, and so Gorsuch is like, I'm going to get my property. And Parker looks at him with the U.S. Marshal standing next to me. and said, I'm going to tell you what, old man, you come up those stairs. Once you're up there, you're mine. And there was a self-defense community in Christiana where black folks and some white folks were about, we're not having this. And so Parker's wife begins to ring the bell that something really wicked this way comes. And black folks were pouring out with their pitchforks, with their knives, some with a rusty revolver. And Gorsuch is like, I'm not leaving here till I get what's mine. And they were like, as you wish. And Gorsuch dies. Parker and the, the, the fugitive slaves that, uh, were, that, that were running from Gorsuch, they run up to Frederick Douglass's house. <laughs> so they moved from Pennsylvania all the way up to Rochester, New York. And Douglas like, ooh, I heard. And let me get you on a boat to Canada. And he gets them on a boat to Canada with just a few minutes left. And, and Parker, William Parker, hands Frederick Douglass, Douglass Gorsuch's gun. And Douglas called it his most prized possession. I tell that story because so much of what we're talking about here is resistance, resistance to a Leviathan, resistance to an oppressive power. And part of what we have to understand is that black folks have been resisting for a long time. The legacy that Elizabeth is talking about, that Emily is talking about, this is a legacy that goes back to the time when black folks got here. And we need to understand that that is that root, that is that legacy. So when I was taught that black folks just took it when they were enslaved and that Lincoln freed the slaves, oh no, oh no, black folks fought back. And we have to understand that, that that resistance is such a key element of American history. It's as a key element of who we are and how we roll. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a note to open up to the audience upon, right? So the audience is ready. I'm just gonna start tossing out some of the great questions that we've collected so far. And I have to start with this one. There are two people who are asking the same question. We've got Zara, we've got Jacqueline. Um, in a nutshell, how do we overcome? What, do, what can we do to overcome the systemic racism? Um, how do we make headway against such a large wall of opposition to the truth? Okay, I'm gonna jump in here. <laughs> um, part of it, what we cannot do is just cede our power and just say, oh, there's nothing we can do. This thing is always messed up, always gonna be messed up. What we do is we fight, we fight, we imagine what our future can be. We imagine how great it can be. And then we organize, we mobilize, and we move on all fronts. We move on the electoral front. We move on the grassroots front. We don't back down. 
That's how you begin to dismantle this, by creating these very strong narratives of what we are, who we are, and what we can be, and then envisioning it and fighting for it. And, 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 and understanding it is a multi-front fight, just the way oppression is a multi-front fight. Just to add to that too, you know, I think, I mean, we have here some of the people that have really um, enhanced our understanding of the freedom movement in general. I mean, I think that the freedom movement can and should be a guide for us. And, I, and we often forget that it takes organizing, it takes commitment, it takes being out there and talking to people and working with people and building coalitions. It's not, you know, I think we often forget today, or at least my students forget, you know, it's not just about retweeting things. Um, it's about getting in, in the streets. And for me, um, in teaching the history of the freedom movement, um, and, you know, like that is that is our best guide. Um, but of course, we have to ensure that we go further um, and complete um, the full vision that we have been fighting for, as Professor Anderson pointed out, since uh, the, the, the 17th century. I think we have to keep building connections. I think we need to see ourselves and each other and really welcome a diversity of tactics. I think one of the, you know, I saw all of that as sort of powerful elements of the summer of 2020, that folks were coming out in really huge numbers and that they were articulating over and over again, the connections between, between different kinds of issues, right? So it was, it was, Obviously, you know, these over and over again acts of police violence and other kinds of racist violence. And it was also talking about what is the world we want, right? We're in this context of the, the sort of early height of COVID and really seeing our dependence on each other and on, uh, on the sort of world as we knew it, but also that there were maybe some new possibilities. Hey, maybe we can have a universal basic income. Maybe there are, you know, maybe student loan debt can be frozen or canceled, right? Maybe there are some connections between what we choose to fund that harms us and what we don't fund that we need, right? Um, and that we kind of see, as I said, see ourselves in each other as people who might be drawn by one particular kind of issue, but can begin to see how that's part of a broader agenda and a set of visions and a range of tactics that people have different kinds of things to contribute that we might disagree sometimes about tactics, but we don't always have to interfere with them, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I found that moment just so incredibly hopeful and then so incredibly sad, right? Um, as we began to see the, the level of repression and violence against action in the street and, uh, and also, you know, punitive policies coming down um, to pursue people, right? But it was just two short years ago, right? We can, we can get back to that moment and we can also look back to decades earlier, right? And share that knowledge and move us, moves forward. Well, after, after Reagan won 49 states, things looked pretty bleak. And, but fortunately, a couple of weeks later, the anti-apartheid movement started mushrooming and people really need to get organized. They need to vote. And I think when I agree with what you're talking about internet interconnectivity, I think they need to really focus on economic issues and somehow break this whole, you know, try, try to try to come together on a common, expand uh, the agenda and really talk about bread and butter issues and resist. Thank you, thank you. Um, so many things are running through my mind. I always teach my students, for example, about just looking at the signs, the March on Washington signs, for example, that there were so many of them were about police brutality and violence, right? So how there's this past that's there, but we're not, it's not shown to us. And that's what our, our one of our audience members wants us to address, uh, Todd. He says, all of this is wonderful, but it often feels like scholarly works end where radicals begin without ever citing them. Mumia Abu-Jamal, Kwame Toure, George Jackson, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde. 
They were right about the nature of the police, white supremacy and capitalism and American society. Can you say more about, about this? Uh, the politics of citation, bringing in these voices, especially people like the Ashanti Austins who are still with us um, in our midst. I mean, I, I'll i jump in because I think that's absolutely the point of the book, right? And I think I would also say organizations too, not just individuals. Um, and in part because I think that when we look to organizations, we start to, and then we dig into say the history of a particular organization, then we see even a greater multiplicity, multiplicity of people, right? It doesn't become just a particular leader who is a particularly good speaker, let's say, or a good writer um, uh, who has a kind of charisma, but also the folks who, you know, do make the copies or at least, you know, back in the day, made the mimeographs, right? Um, or who were sort of learning, but, but beginning to put together, you know, projects, right? Who really were skilled at things that didn't sort of have the glamor, right? Or don't have the glamor, but, um, but that drive a campaign forward, right? Or build an organization. Um, so one of the things I think, you know, I think our book is there are individual named people, but there are actually a greater number of organizations um, that, you know, it, we really wanted to kind of foreground that collective um, struggle. But I think that, you know, the politics of citation are absolutely central, right? And that we really um, need to, to kind of constantly again and again, like enlarge our vocabulary of the people that we do cite. Thank you, thank you. And I, I totally, I totally, um, I totally agree. I know that in my coursework, I definitely have brought back the people that made me, the June Jordans, you know, the, the Alice Walkers, the, you know, the radical thinkers, the George Jacksons, who oftentimes are marginalized in, in different curricula. Okay, let's talk about faith communities. Um, one of our audience members had a question about that. Um, how can we think about the role of faith communities in, in your work in this contemporary era? How do we deal with, with, with that sort of element when we're thinking about the Black Revolution or the debate around guns or the, the struggles around um, electoral politics and presidential politics? Go ahead. Go ahead, Carol. Yes. <laughs> You're um, good. I think one of the things that's really important for us to see is the diversity of the, the faith community um, that you, and it's just like the movement. So when you're teaching the civil rights movement, you, you we tend to just go Martin Luther King without understanding that there was a large group of black Baptists who were like, look, I don't know why you're out there protesting. We're gonna get ours in the by and by. Um, you know, we just have to just to kind of hunker down here and just take it because that's what good Christians do. You're upsetting things. And I mean, and so you have this battle at the National Baptist Convention. And so I think about today, the role of Reverend Barber, who is out there with this beautiful, expansive vision of, of, of all of us and, and what a humane society really looks like how it deals with issues of poverty, how it deals with issues of healthcare, how it deals with issues of quality education, how it deals with issues of the right to vote. I mean, it is a multi-layered faith-based movement that is powerful. And I see it as an incredible counter to, because part of what the Trump years have done that didn't happen during the Reagan years was to pull back the layer of what, white evangelicalism actually really believes in. And it, it's not about Christianity. It's not about Jesus. It, it is about white supremacist power. It is about patriarchy. And so it is being really clear about which faith community and how we need the faith communities that really, one of the things that happened in the movement is that folks tapped into that sense of something greater than themselves. As I tell my students, God's not going to do you any good in Mississippi. You cannot walk into Mississippi with God. 
you have to walk in with God because <laughs> walking in with God is the thing that gives you the strength to take what Mississippi is going to, to dish out to you. And it is that power of tapping into that faith that that becomes part of the organizing tradition um, and these multiple faiths. And so that is also part of what we have to um, really tap into. And Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I'm off no, I, I mean, you pretty much said it all. I mean, one thing I would add, or I guess two things is, you know, I think that um, faith, black faith communities, the black, ch black churches have been central to the freedom struggle historically. And we're also central to um, making demands on uh, city governments during and after rebellions. Um, we, you know, we often don't think about, about this necessarily, but churches were, um, were really, really key church leaders, ministers, pastors um, in these moments and used um, the violence as an opportunity to make a set of demands um, on the city, on cities and on states. So I think that's really important. And just to add, you know, in addition to Reverend Barber, I think that people like Michael McBride, I mean, many of the the those who are offering the most exciting visions for racial and economic justice in the U.S. are coming from um, black churches, and so you know I think we we should expect to continue to see um, you know black faith leadership as being central um, to the struggle moving forward. Yeah, I would I would echo everything that uh, Elizabeth and Carol said, and also just add in that. You know, I think thinking about um, about organizing in mosques, you know, both both and in the NOI, like thinking about Muslim organizing and also thinking about interfaith work is uh, really central for thinking about the breadth of radical movements across the kind of post sixties period, right? Um, some of the examples of faith-based organizing that we highlight in the book include um, rural, rural organizing against the right, the central role of churches um, in both working towards, in, especially in rural communities, multiracial coalitions, um, and in pushing back against the kind of supposed dominance, right, of the Christian right over what it means to be um, Christian, as well as uh, to really kind of work for um, solidarity with more mi minoritized religious communities, including Jewish communities, Muslim communities, Buddhist communities, and, and so on, right? Um, also the centrality of uh, Christian left organizing in the sanctuary movement um, in the 1980s, right? Um, uh, for Central American and other immigrants and refugees. So there's really, we there is a rich, kind of set of scholarship on faith-based organizing from the left um, for decades, but I think we just need more of it, right? We really need to kind of highlight those sources and not seed the ground that, you know, somehow to work in faith is to work for the forces of reaction and white supremacy. This is absolutely, we know that that's not true. Unfortunately, we're going to have to like close this wonderful conversation. I feel like we could, we're just getting started and I feel like we could go for another hour. Um, but we wanted to thank all of our panelists. We wanted to thank our audience. Um, this was such a needed conversation today and such a, a, you know, conversation for the spirit, particularly in this difficult week. Um, we wanted to remind you one more time about our June 2nd conversation which again is gonna be a special one. We're gonna be showing clips of the two films, The Sun Rises in the East and Takeover and having a conversation with the directors. That's again, Thursday, June 2nd, as always, 6.30 Eastern time. Again, all of our panelist books are available. We just dropped the link in the Schomburg shop. Please, if you don't have their books, please buy them. Um, and we just wanted to say thank you and to have a safe, and um, justice filled night and going forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you all. Wonderful meeting you. Thank you. Bye.